Welcome uh, to the League of Women Voters General Meeting. This is the second in our series on uh, the government and the general welfare. The, the topic for the evening is communication, communicating freedoms, limitations, and responsibilities. And I'd like to kind of remind you, since we all are good remember our Constitution, that the really one of the few general welfare issues that actually makes an appearance in the Constitution is uh, a responsibility for post offices and postal roads. So by talking about communication, we are really going back to our roots as Americans, and we are looking at something that the government thought was important enough to actually, actually put right in the Constitution. So tonight we will be talking about, about uh, communication communicating and we will be taking a look at it. We have four speakers this evening uh, that will be addressing us on the on the topic and uh, Bill Bernstein, Mike Dewey, uh, Mary Beth Henry and Sheldon Raynon. Raynon? Raynon. Renan. Renan. I'm sorry about that. And um, they will be addressing us in that order. Let me introduce our first speaker for the evening. Our first speaker is Bill, Bill Bernstein. Bill is Dr. Bill Bernstein. He is a PhD, MD. He's a neurologist, but he is on what, a second or third career now that, that he has gone on from his, and he, he is now um, the co-founded Efficient Frontiers Advisors who actually give advice on investing. And he has also done tremendous research on finance and economic history. He, uh, his writings on economic history include The Birth of Plenty, which uh, was about the economic growth inflection of the early 19th century, A, a Splendid Exchange, which uh, was a very widely recognized book that uh, discussed the history of trade, and Masters of the Word, which just came out in April, which is a excellent book on the history of the word. And he is going to be our speaker on that today. He'll lead off the panel and basically give us that historic context that will take us forward so that when we hear the other panelists, we will have those opportunities. So with that, I will turn it over to Bill. Well, my family is forever telling me that I either need uh, new material or a new audience, so it's always nice to talk to a, uh, a new audience. Um, I first became interested in this subject, the subject of communications, technology, and politics, when I was writing my last book. And one of the duller narratives in the book had to do with the repeal of the Corn Laws, which were a series of repressive uh, trade tariffs that were levied on basically poor people uh, in England, and they needed to be repealed as a progressive measure. And that repeal didn't get done until the middle of the 19th century. And it took the introduction of the railroad and the telegraph to accomplish that. And I realized as I was reading the political process involved with repeal that in an era when only rich people could communicate and travel, which was really the case before the advent of the railroad uh, in, in England, everyone else is disempowered. And that the diffusion of the leading edge technology among the general population is largely what determines political uh, structure, and that's kind of a mouthful. Uh, and so by way of expanding that and sort of unpacking that, uh, I'll you know broaden the discussion to just say that there have been four real advances in human communication technology. The first was human speech. It's about 100,000 years old. It's, an, it's, what, it's what really enables us to cooperate with each other and to survive uh, among a population of animals that has much bigger teeth and can fly and run faster uh, than, than we can. That's really the only thing we have uh, in the wild. Otherwise, we're going to become somebody's lunch very quickly, is, is our ability to communicate. The second great technology was the encoding of that speech into abstract symbols, namely writing. The third was the industrialization of writing, that is the printing press. And the fourth was the electronic encoding, really, of all information. And, it, you know, it may seem kind of silly to include speech as a communications technology, but it helps frame the issue. Because if you think about a society that is pre-literate, 
uh, pre-industrial, pre-literate, in which speech is the only method of communication, uh, you realize that this is a society where everybody has pretty much the same ability to communicate. So you have this leading edge technology, if you will, speech, which is very widely diffused in the general population. And what anthropologists have known for really decades is that pre-industrial aboriginal societies tend to be fairly democratic. In fact, there's a structure that you can detect really around the globe in pre-literate societies, which is a an assembly which consists of adult males, uh, and then there's a council of elders, sort of a senate, uh, which consists of the senior and more powerful members of the group. But really, you know, there's no despotism or relatively little despotism in pre-industrial societies. The other place you see that in modern societies is in pirate organizations, which throughout the centuries have been uh, notoriously uh, democratic. Now, 5,000 years ago, writing is invented uh, in southern Mesopotamia. And you see the first great civilizations flowering at that point, and that's not an accident. If you're going to organize thousands or millions of people into a city-state or into an empire, you need writing to do it. Writing is what basically expands or, or commands the hierarchy. All politics is about communication. And, and in a society in which the writing system is very, very complex, and make no mistake about it, the first writing systems, cuneiform and uh, hieroglyphics, uh, were, were, were extremely complex systems. They took about 10 years to learn. Who had 10 years? Only the children of the elites, all right? So you had a very narrow elite of people who could read and write. We tend to think of a scribe as some guy sitting on a, quarter tra on a street corner transcribing letters. No. If you you were a scribe in Egypt or in Mesopotamia, you were an investment banker and a high-tech entrepreneur and a GS-15 all rolled up into one. You determined who lived and who died, who worked and where you, where, where you worked uh, and who didn't work and who starved. Um, there's a wonderful quote uh, that survived over the millennia uh, that it records advice given by a scribe to his son. Put writing in your heart that you may protect yourself from hard labor of any kind. I have seen the metal worker at his task at the mouth of the furnace with fingers like a crocodile's. He stank worse than fish spawn. The weaver in a workshop is worse off than a woman. He squats with his knees to his belly and he does not taste fresh air. Well, this is remote antiquity's equivalent of, hey kid, you better hit the books if you don't want to be flipping burgers for the rest of your life. Uh, except the alternative was much worse than flipping uh, burgers. Now, the Egyptian system involves evolves into an alphabetic system. I don't have time to describe that. But this evolves, this Egyptian system evolves into Phoenicians, into the Phoenician system, which was the first alphabet, which was still pretty hard to learn because it didn't have any vowels. But the Phoenicians were great traders, and sometime around the 8th century BC, they alight, a, you know, a, a, a Phoenician ship alights in Greece, and the Greeks, who are illiterate at the time, say, whoa, this is really cool. You have these letters, uh, but you know, you guys are Semites. You've got, you know, these sounds that come from way back in your throat. We need, we're Greeks. We need vowels. Uh, and so they take a couple of the letters they have no use for and they convert them into vowels. And at a stroke, you have a system that can unambiguously code all human speech and which is very easy to learn. And the average, you know, and a six year old can learn uh, to uh, read uh, an alphabetic system. And in the high classical period of the Athenian uh, Republic, uh, you know, the fifth, fourth centuries uh, BC, probably 30 to 40 percent of citizens, that is adult guys, uh, could, uh, were, were literate. Uh, and, you know, I have no doubt that, that, you know, Athenian yuppies bragged to each other that little Alexandros, you know, could read, uh, you know, the Aeneid by the time he was, you know, four years old. Um, where does democracy develop? All right. It develops in a place where the leading edge communication technology is accessible to everyone. It doesn't evolve in Babylonia and it certainly doesn't evolve into Egypt. Now, after 
the fall of Athens, uh, literacy goes into decline. It goes into decline in Rome. In Rome, really, the, the, at first, the only people who could read and write were actually Greek, Greek slaves who basically functioned as word processors for rich uh, Romans. And literacy declines uh, even further during the European, the so-called European Dark Ages. And the church main, is the only group that, main, that remains literate, and particularly the Benedictines. And this was an important church monopoly. Now you have literacy being restricted again, the church becoming all powerful or very, very powerful. And the, the church not only ran, for all practical purposes, temporal uh, affairs, but it ran something and controlled something much more important, which was access to heaven and to the, into the afterlife. And therefore, they very jealously guarded their ability to, to, to read and to write and to write books. Well, Gutenberg blows that apart. Uh, he makes written books much less, much more uh, uh, inexpensive. Uh, literacy expands, and the power of the church uh, uh, gets threatened. And you know, make no mistake about it, the church was very, very unhappy about the increase in literacy and about the printing press. And you can see this in the letter written by one of the Benedictines, a man by the name of Filippo de Strada, who was on a um, uh, uh, a monastery in the Venetian archipelago in a letter he wrote to the doge trying to get the printing presses of Venice closed down because, and I'll quote again, they shamelessly print at negligible cost material which may, alas, inflame impressionable youths while a true writer dies of hunger and a young girl reads Ovid to learn sinfulness. I love that. Writing indeed, which brings gold for us He's pretty honest about that, should be respected and held to be nobler than all goods, unless she has suffered degradation in the brothel of the printing presses. She is a maiden with a pen, a harlot in print. Well, this is the medieval equivalent of look at all this junk on the internet. Uh, our children can't concentrate anymore. It's eroded social discourse. And by the way, it's also caused the death of investigative journalism. All right. This is merely the how of yet one more empowered elite about to lose its monopoly on a leading edge community or had been a leading edge communications technology. This is a very old story. In fact, in Plato, you can find Plato howling about the advent of literacy uh, uh, in, the, in, you know, in the form of uh, Socratic, uh, the Socratic dialogues. Well, finally, we get to the electronic encoding of, of, uh, of information. And the most despotic medium when you study the history of communications technology, by far is radio. Why? Everybody can own a radio, but who can own a radio station, a broadcast station? In Europe, it was only the governments. In the United States, it was large corporations. So you have a very powerful and hypnotic medium. Uh, make no mistake that it was hypnotic. I mean, you know, one man was able to convince millions of people, mainly below the Mason-Dixon line, uh, that, that the Martians had landed. All right. Uh, so it's a very hypnotic medium. Uh, you know, television is very much the same way. What did Walter Cronkite say at the end of his broadcasts? He said, that's the way it is. I'm Walter Cronkite and you ain't. Uh, and so, you know, it's a very despotic medium. I'm not going to talk about how the Nazis did a brilliant job of monopolizing it and how unbelievably incompetent the Soviets were. The Soviets built 50 million shortwave radios to allow Radio Free Europe and the Voice of America to, to get into their, their, their country. It was unbelievably incompetent uh, of, of them. And so finally, we come to the Internet age, which I'm really not going to talk about, but I'll let your imaginations run wild. Who really controls the Internet? Uh, uh, and that's a really good question. I think the answer we give now after LaFerre Snowden may be a little different than the answer most people would have given six months ago. But I would simply give my opinion that, that the field, the playing field, however much uh, and however powerful the NSA and the powers of darkness and the less democratic parts of the, of the world are, uh, that the playing field has still been, been, been leveled. Uh, that, uh, you know, 50 years ago, the average citizen brought a knife to a gunfight when they fought the government, and now both sides have guns. And it's going to be a very interesting uh, uh, process to see play out. Thank you, thank you, Bill, and, and we will move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Michael Dewey, and um, 
Mike is a Salem native and a graduate of Arizona State University. He has a degree in political science. He has served as president of the Capital Club, the professional lobby or lobbyist organization, the, the Salem Chamber of Commerce, and the Salem Education Foundation. And most importantly, he is executive director of the Oregon Cable Telecommunications Association and manages projects pertaining to telecommunications Oh boy! Telecommunication policy, planning, solid waste, agriculture, commodities, and energy policy. So he has quite a mixed bag that that he is handling at the present time, and I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him get started. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, you may wonder about the uh, solid waste and telecommunications. Uh, <laughs> our firm uh, represents a variety of clients. Waste management would be one of those. So you get a you get a. Fine. Is it on? No. Okay. So uh, what I want to do first, let me just give you a little uh, history about the uh, cable industry and, and how we got there. And Sheldon, hopefully there's not a test later, because uh, I really enjoyed that. But I can't remember some of the, some of the names. So. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about uh, the history of the cable industry, because Mary Beth will talk about uh, the role she plays in the uh, in the Portland area. So I've represented the uh, cable industry since 1974. And uh, if you look back, I'm going to ask you some questions in a few minutes. Um, the cable companies were video companies. Uh, Portland in 1974 did not have a, a cable company or cable companies. Uh, Salem didn't. Uh, Eugene did because there was not a CBS affiliate. That was the only reason. And the cable companies were in primarily the rural parts of the, uh, the state. The only part of Portland was in the West Hills. And that was owned by one of the uh, broadcasters in Seattle because you couldn't get reception. And for quite some time, that didn't change, primarily because the rules at the FCC, in part promoted by the motion picture industry, and the broadcasters were fairly onerous. And once Ted Turner started to take off and the satellite industry and HBOs and others started to take off and there was more content, there was the opportunity in more densely populated areas to provide a vast array of channels. And now we have, if you will, thousands of channels. And many of those are on the internet. They're not on a cable company, a satellite company, or a telephone company's. Uh, today in Oregon, um, just so you get a sense, uh, Comcast, which operates in the uh, Willamette Valley in the Portland area, is the largest uh, cable company. The next largest is Charter. And they're on the coast, eastern Oregon, and in southern Oregon. And then there's companies like Wave Broadband and Ben Broadband over in uh, the central Oregon area, and some smaller cable companies, which are primarily also telephone companies. So I wanted to ask you first, because I'm gonna make some comments about who controls content and networks. So I wanna get a sense of your video uh, company. So raise your hand if it's a cable company. If it's a satellite company. If it's a telephone company. And the rest of you would be probably over the air. And there's actually, interestingly enough, uh, a new, uh, which is at the Supreme Court, or perhaps at the Supreme Court, the court hasn't decided to hear it, Aereo, and Mary Beth knows about this particular uh, IPTV, Internet Protocol TV, that allows you to get over the air with a very small antenna, and you can DVR programs through Apple, Google, and Google TV and other devices for about $12 a month for over-the-air broadcast. So a lot has changed. So let me talk for a second then about, my assumption is, we'll do the same thing on data. Is the cable company your internet or data company? Want to get a sense of that? Raise your hand. Uh, telephone company, Frontier, Quest, uh, Satellite, or somebody else. And I assume most of you have an internet connection. And you're very savvy with this and the applications and the like. 
So the discussion here today, uh, there's two premises here. In history, who controlled communications controlled the world? And is it the role of government to control access and content? And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So for the cable industry, just to give you a perspective, the video, and some of you may have read this, um, the video side of the cable industry or any entity, be it a telephone company, a satellite company, is very challenging uh, in the sense that there are so many uh, individuals that are tech savvy and are trying to find a way to cut the cord to save money. So they're looking for this Aereo product, for example, Hulu, which could be free at some point in time, Apple TV, Google TV. Intel is now doing a beta test with their uh, employees to see if they can figure out a better set-top box and to get in the industry. And you have all the individuals that are trying to figure out a way to download ESPN without having to be a part of the cable company the telephone company and the like, and individuals are very, very tech savvy. So those are the names that are existing today, uh, but trust me, there will be additional companies that come along, entrepreneurial, that will want to be in this business. So it's very, very challenging, the video industry. And we'll talk about regulations in a few minutes. Uh, the data business is a bit different. The data industry is, is growing. And it's growing because uh, more and more people want higher speeds. The companies are investing in higher speeds. We were at a conference the other day, and the discussion was in the last year, the major companies have invested in the last couple of years $280 billion in infrastructure in the United States to get more capacity and higher speeds because all of the networks that are working through the uh, through these companies and, 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 and with the cloud. So it's very important to understand that the data business is, is a fairly good business for most companies, and it's fairly good because the business side is growing. Again, it used to be that you received your television service from the cable company, your voice service from the telephone company, and those were utilities to a degree Obviously, the telephone company was. There was competition in the video side, over the air and subscription. And you move to now the business side, where the businesses have an opportunity from an array of companies to get higher speeds and lower costs in the marketplace, particularly smaller businesses uh, or medium-sized businesses. And also, the, uh, these companies, the cable companies and others, are getting into the uh, into the uh, home security uh, business through a Wi-Fi network. So the voice business, though, is, is kind of interesting. And, and Mary Beth knows this because they do the franchising on the voice side. And cable companies are in the voice business now. Often it's a triple play. You, ha you take the data service, the video service, and voice. But on the wireline side, um, it's no longer a zero-sum game. In other words, uh, if Comcast were to take a customer from CenturyLink and they go back and forth, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, we're seeing a significant decline in wireline customers because of this, and primarily because young people do not have a wireline. My, my daughter's uh, married. She lives in Scottsdale. And they do not have a wireline. My son's in DC. He's married. They do not have a wireline. So that tells you that this is their communication device. So when we talk about, in history, who controls content, controls the world, I think at one point in time that was true. And, and I grew up, was born in the 1950s, and uh, we had three or four channels at that point in time. Radio was ubiquitous. You had the newspaper that was ubiquitous. Now I think about the Oregonian. And this is kind of how sad it is for me, because I like to read the Oregonian on paper. So I have to go out of my way four times, I guess three or four times, in Salem to pick up the, uh, the newspaper at the Plaid Pantry. Now I can get it online, and I'm really happy when, it, when I get to my office and the newspaper is there. But that tells you about 
where content and communications is going. So I, I would argue that, uh, I'm gonna be a little flippant here, that in this day and age, whoever controls not the world, but controls countries, controls the military, and I'll make one other observation. I think in terms of controlling content, uh, this but much smaller, a video recorder, once you had the opportunity for in dictatorships, countries like that, when somebody was able to film something that the government did not want you to film, and you were able to get that out of that particular country, and you were able to show the world that what the government said did in fact not happen. In other words, the government said, we didn't have a civil war, here it is. We didn't have an atrocity, here it is. So just in terms of the transmitters, the uh, translators and the like, I mean, that was very, very important. So I look at this particular device and my iPad, which I don't have with me, my other computers that I, I don't have with me right now, and I can go anywhere I want, anywhere on the World Wide Web. Now I can't, you know, there's some places that because of security you can't go, but I can go almost anywhere I want. And that's remarkable. If I want to get a stock price, right now I can get it. Now I couldn't do that in 1950, 1960, and 1970. And that is really, really important. So I think there's been a sea change because of the internet in terms of how content is, is controlled. Now I'll tell you something very interesting. Uh, you all know about Netflix, and Netflix has now more subscribers than HBO. And Netflix is very interesting because in a cable system, they eat up about 30, 35% of the capacity of a cable system. So in other words, it's one of those situations where the cable company competes with Netflix, but Netflix use that, uses that network to get into the business of providing video. So one of the other areas I wanted to talk about very quickly was the area of regulation and government control because that was one of the questions. So in 1984, the cable industry by Congress was deregulated and there were substantial investments. In 1992, it was re-regulated and investments did not flourish at that point in time, primarily because there was right regulation in the market. And I can remember, um, some of you may remember uh, Counselor Commissioner Eric Stein. He and I had a debate over this, uh, these uh, regulations a number of years ago. So one of the areas that I want to be, and in, in where we come from, is to be very cognizant when you have more regulations, you have the probably the, the advent of less investments in infrastructure. So be sure about that. The other part, and I want to finish with, uh, is the discussion about should government control access, should, should it control content, and I think probably most of you would say no. Uh, government ought to be good at public safety, transportation, education, both K through 12 and higher education, senior programs, human resources, mental health, and the like. But there are a number of broadband networks that the government owns and there are usually municipalities. Often it's a common denominator where the electric utility is the investor, but the city owns the electric company. And that's not unusual in a number of communities. Uh, McMinnville has, a, uh, has their own electric company. They're not in this business. Ashland at one time got into the video business and that didn't work out very well because the electric company had to subsidize the losses of the uh, cable company. And what happens is it, it always will happen where government isn't nimble when there's competition. Uh, they're not entrepreneurial by any means. They don't have the business acumen to run a system where there is competition. In, in Ashland, what happens is uh, they didn't realize that the content, ESPN, and the other providers were continuing to ask for about a 10 to 20% increase annually in rates. And you can only raise the rates to the subscriber so far. And welcome to the real world is basically 
what happened. So you had the unintended consequences of cross subsidies and governments at some point have to say to the, to the folks that live in the community that uh, if you want to continue to invest in this community or in this, in this asset, uh, we may have to have cross subsidies, raise, raise electric rates in order to pay off the bonds, whatever the case may be. So um, what I want to talk about there is that um, a lot of people want to talk about government networks. I think there's not as much discussion about that because there is so much competition in the marketplace. And if you make a misstep, um, it's not going to be good for other services that I, that I talked about. I will finish with this is uh, don't blink in terms of what's happening in telecommunications because there will be new companies, there will be new applications, and it's really all about applications today in, in the cloud. Uh, but I would say this, though, in the areas that are primarily rural, um, where there are not vibrant networks, uh, there has to be some sort of subsidy if companies cannot make a go of it. So there needs to be a subsidy, and we do have a program in Oregon that does that. It's probably a little too big right now, but nonetheless, um, we would support areas that, uh, that are unserved in terms of Internet access, and price and stability, that there ought to be a, a subsidy, we ought to all pay for that. And rather than have the incumbent network uh, receive that subsidy, it might be an RFP or request for proposal to have some competition in the marketplace. So this is a, a wonderful, wonderful time in the telecommunications area. And to our moderator, I thought she was going to say that telecommunications was in the Constitution as opposed to uh, post offices because we're always thinking of it. So as my dad says, the only constant is change and that's clearly going to happen in the telecommunications industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our, our third speaker this evening is Mary Beth Henry, who is the manager of the Office for Community Technology, Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission for the City of Portland. Um, she's a graduate of the University of Minnesota, and her, her office, which they call OCT, catalyzes the investments of resources to ensure that benefits of communication technology are available to everyone as part of an equitable, sustainable, and economic healthy community. Uh, they administer the city's franchising program and the street use privilege tax, and they also administer the city's utility license law. And Mary Beth serves on the Oregon Broadband Advisory Council and the League of Oregon Cities Broadband Standing Committee. She focuses on legislation and policy issues related to broadband, communication, maintaining local authority, and digital inclusion. And she's been in deeply involved in local government efforts to protect the public interest as legislative efforts on communication uh, policy move at the state and federal level. And I also noted on the internet that she says she's a, a Twitter geek. So I will throw that in just to show where she's coming. Mary Beth. <laughs> Thank you. And many thanks to the League of Women Voters for recognizing the importance of communications policy uh, here in Portland. As the difference between a phone, a television, and the cable system vanishes, broadband internet is taking over the functions of all these separate communications networks we've known. It is incumbent upon us to ensure that these networks are accessible by all and that they promote free, spe free speech, foster innovation, and foster broad economic growth. I find it useful sometimes to look at the past in order to inform the present the original reason for forming the office that I work in was that in the early 1980s, cable companies needed to use one of the most valuable resources within our community, our streets or public rights of way. And we leveraged our right of way authority to require that the cable companies be responsive to local community needs and interests. So while our roots are in the cable area, as wired and wireless technologies have evolved and the regulatory climate shifts, so too has the focus of our office. Thus the name change 
from the cable office to the Office for Community Technology. Let's look at some of the statistics surrounding the technological shift. How many of you have a smartphone? Well, the number of global smartphone shipments is set to experience staggering growth, reaching one billion phones shipped in 2016, a 230% increase from last year. 91% of the adult population in America own some kind of cell phone, and one in four teens are cell mostly, meaning they use their cell phone to go online. Skype, there were 663 million registered users at the end of 2010, and at peak times, 40 million people are using Skype. The internet, 70% of American adults have high-speed broadband internet at home. In Multnomah County, through the Your Voice, Our Communications Technology Survey, we learned that 80% of our households have internet at home, but in households with income of 30,000 and under, only 50% have internet at home. And many people, as Mike talked about, are streaming video using, um, through Netflix and using Roku. So what do we do at the local level? What is our role? I'm gonna to touch on four areas. Regulatory oversight and consumer protection, broadband strategy, advocacy, and community investment. Consumer protection is one of the most important aspects of regulatory oversight. As the companies have consolidated and grown, customer service, subscriber policies, rates and charges, and complaint resolution have begun to be centralized in corporate structures outside the local area. This can make it difficult for staff to address consumer protection issues. However, this is an area where local governments have to be vigilant for their citizens. Subscribers have nowhere else to turn. The Federal Communications Commission refers them back to the local government. The state attorney general and consumer affairs offices only take complaints for the record and they'll work on an issue only if there is some major trend. So we're basically it, and we take complaints uh, in, for phone, for cable television, and for internet, regardless of the provider, even though we really have no regulatory authority over internet. Uh, in the area of wireless, we oversee siting of wireless attachments on poles in the right-of-way, and another part of the city, the Bureau of Development Services, oversees wireless on private property. In the area of wireline, CenturyLink and Comcast are the primary providers for residential service in Portland, and we negotiate agreements with these companies who wish to use the right-of-way. And we will use our regulatory tools when appropriate to further the public interest. The second area is broadband strategy. Why is developing a local broadband strategy important? I think a spoke, I heard a quote from a spokesperson for Calix, a company, and this is what the person said and it really resonated with me. It's important because we are educating our children for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that have, yet, have not yet been invented to solve problems that we are not yet aware of. And if we don't have the technological platform to do this, and other communities in the US or the world do, we are putting our community at a terrible disadvantage. We need to be intentional and provide leadership at the local level on communications and broadband issues. Now you can view the internet uh, and communications as an information commons that we all, or at least most of us, can access. You could say, well, wireless communications networks, they use the airwaves, that could be considered a commons, 
and wireline communication networks, they use our streets and our rights of way, which belong to everybody in the community. So fundamentally, communications networks or broadband internet is a virtual commons, ideally accessible by anyone at any time in order to do anything. Now, it doesn't exactly work this way because some people don't have access due to um, either they can't afford it or they don't understand why it would be important to their lives. Yet the internet has become essential to get more people online and plugged in to the economic and social benefits of broadband, our communities must solve the problem of accessibility, affordability, and relevance. Otherwise, the digital divide, the gap between the broadband haves and have-nots, will widen, exacerbating the income disparity that already exists between the wealthy and the poor. And unless we address this issue, it will have a profound negative impact on all sectors of our economy. Business, education, transportation, public safety, sustainability, and health. We believe that broadband is the key to Portland's future because broadband has become a necessity and that means there is a role for public policy. Our tagline is connecting to our future. Just as electricity was the game changer at the beginning of the last century, the internet is having rapid, widespread, and dramatic impacts on our society. Electricity was invented to turn on the lights, but it powered the transformation to an industrial society. It was really impossible to know in advance that electrification would provide critical infrastructure to power companies, radio, TV, home appliances, financial markets, manufacturing, the list goes on. We cannot yet know the impacts of broadband. It has become integral to our lives. The majority of job listings are online. Our kids need to be online to do their homework. We used to use encyclopedias to look up information. Now we Google it. We use the internet to pay our bills, to download music, to socialize, to look up health information, to watch TV, to buy things, to take books out of the library. That list can go on. Well, fiber and wireless are essential and complementary infrastructures that we need here in Portland. Fiber offers theoretically infinite capacity and it's scalable, and wireless offers us mobility, connectivity during movement, but it does require fiber backhaul. And I have a very short video clip that shows why fiber is so important. By some measures, the Netherlands already has the best internet service in Europe. To show you what that means, I've enlisted the help of my friend Robert Lachendijk. He's at home in Amsterdam, I'm at my house in Brooklyn, and we're having a head-to-head -head race downloading the same file. It's about the size of a few dozen holiday snapshots. Ready? Go! Robert's internet connection races along while mine crawls. In about a minute, he has the file while I wait. His connection is about 20 times faster than mine. So that gives you an idea of um, why speed is so important. You can imagine if you're a small business or a large business, what the difference would be if you were transferring large files to accomplish your business. I think the difference between today's broadband speed and fiber to the home is a, the same order of magnitude as the difference for those of us who remember uh, yesterday's dial-up versus today's cable modem or DSL. When we had dial-up speeds, we didn't conceive of Amazon, Netflix, or Facebook, much less video streaming. We don't know what new capabilities fiber to the home will unlock, 
but we do know they'll be similarly transformational. And I think it's impor particularly important for the Portland area because we have such a high number of home-based businesses. The third area that we uh, work on in my office is advocacy. Whether it be a local community's right to provide broadband, or the authority to tax, or the authority to charge franchise fees for the use of the right-of-way, or to ensure that localities maintain zoning authority for cell towers. Each of these items that I've mentioned is under attack in either Salem, in Congress, or at the Federal Communications Commission. And we could lose any of these local authorities without our advocacy efforts. The final area I'll talk about is catalyzing community investment. And this is an area where, we, where it's really an example of a successful private-public partnership. The institutional network is a fiber-based communications network in Multnomah County. The Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, which is an intergovernmental body of all the jurisdictions in Multnomah County, joined with Comcast to construct and deploy a high-speed community network that connects all schools, libraries, and local government buildings. The partnership agreement provides an interconnection of this local network with the city of Portland's fiber network called Ernie. Interconnecting the public and private networks allows schools, libraries, and local governments to hold the line on bandwidth costs while improving services. The savings on bandwidth connectivity translate into dollars to hire more teachers, more librarians, and have more books in schools. So the schools and the libraries have very robust, affordable bandwidth because of this public-private partnership. A second aspect of catalyzing community investment is the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission's multi-million community technology grant program. Each year, the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission sponsors a competitive grant program, which is open right now. And it closes December 10th. And I believe that you can see the um, URL is mhcrc.org for more information. The competitive grant program provides monies for capital equipment that either uses the institutional network that I described earlier, or provides video content for the community media channels operated by Portland Community Media and Metro East Community Media. Between the two programs, the Cable Commission invests 4.7 million annually into the community by way of upgrades, connecting new sites, grants to schools, nonprofits, libraries, and local governments. In conclusion, there's a very important role for local government in the communications arena as broadband internet has become essential. Whether it's as a provider of broadband or addressing subscriber complaints or advocating for the ability to charge fair compensation for private profit making use of public property or citing wireless facilities, we have a vital role to play. I've always believed that our role as local government officials is to bring the proper amount of the future into the present. Broadband is the platform of the future for Portland, and we want to make sure that anyone can connect anywhere at any time and do anything. Remember what I said earlier. We are educating our children for jobs that don't yet exist using technology that has not yet been invented to solve problems that we are not yet aware of. We need state-of-the-art technology in order to do that, and that means fiber to the home and wireless. Thank you. We have one more speaker tonight, and, and to, who is going to kind of take us into thinking about the future, hopefully, a little bit. Shelton Renan uh, is a Yale graduate, and he has had a fantastic and very interesting career and has just done all sorts of things within communication. Uh, he, he wanted to mention he's currently writing a book, 
which is, is with the working title Entangled, which is about how conductivity is, is changing and how it's changing our future. So he is really kind of thinking about the future. He was born in Portland, Oregon, and he grew up, he said, on a turkey farm before it had electricity. So he's moved all the way through into the future. So he really has been, as he said, he's been electrified, basically getting moving forward. Uh, he has, he founded the Pacific Film Archive at the University of California, Berkeley. He's lectured on media at museums, colleges, and conferences. He's written and consulted with major corporations, including Intel, Xerox, AT&T. In 2003 and four, he wrote a new technology strategy for the state of Florida. Uh, and when, when he wasn't doing all of this, he was doing films and television. So his career has been all over the map, but he is extremely well known as a consultant and an expert in developing media communications. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to him. Well, I'd like to, at the risk of making some unintended enemies, uh, push your button. Oh. I'm so smart about writing films. <laughs> and producing them, but I don't know how to push the button. And that's often a problem. Uh, at, the, at the risk of making an unintended enemy, I'd like to correct a couple of things that have been said. The, the th first, but not the most important, is that it isn't the fact Netflix does not use one third of the capacity. Um, the users in Portland and in Oregon use that capacity, and they have chosen to use, to, to try and tune in to Netflix as opposed to, let's say, HBO. And the reason is pretty simple. There are two reasons, actually. Uh, the first is that um, Netflix charges $9 a month, whereas, as my wife reminds me every month, we pay Comcast <laughs> over $200 a month but we watch Netflix almost as much as we watch what comes over Comcast. In many cases, um, the same uh, programming is available on demand from Comcast and on demand from Netflix. But in Netflix, the $9 covers all demand requirements. And um, at Comcast, if we use Xfinity frequently, there's a charge between three and six dollars to, to look at the same thing that's available for free on Netflix. So it's the users who, in a competitive market, have chosen to use Netflix who are using the capacity. And they're using the capacity, usually, of access that they've paid for. So I, that's uh, one thing I'd like to correct. The other is to begin by saying that this is a very complicated area. I belong to a, a number of discussion groups, and I've been trying for 15 years to write this book, and finally, I'm 72, I'm running out of time. So fortunately, somebody asked for a book proposal, and now I'm doing it. Um, it's very complicated, and uh, more complicated, most of these people on this panel are much more skilled in understanding the technologies and uh, the nits and the bits but the basic issues are not complicated. And that's the second area of disagreement with Mike, who's been in this business a lot longer than I have. But this is not, the real issues are not um, who's gonna control something or, or private or public. The real issues are, are the basic, values provided by connectivity, communications, and collaboration going to be served in a way that will best serve um, the people in Oregon and the people everywhere, and not just the people, the various species, and, and, and the environment, and, and maintaining sustainability. That's the real question, and it really requires um, an organization like um, the League of Women Voters to get involved in this. And I'll tell you why. There's a very special reason why your involvement is needed in helping us sort through this. 
I'm not going to necessarily give you answers. I'm going to tell you what I believe today. But we need to get some involvement here in setting up what are the priorities and then deciding how's the best way to, to, to fit in uh, those priorities. I started a film archive in Berkeley called the Pacific Film Archive and later um, was, because of that, was put on the national the public media panel, the National Endowment for the Arts. And the, the first thing I did when I got on that panel was say, well, we should have lots of regional film centers. And I know one city that could use them, and that was Portland. And they agreed to send me up here. And Ted Mayhar got everybody to come over, and I met with the art museum. I, I wrote the first grant application, and I went back to Washington and voted on it. And 45 years later, you guys have got one which is almost better than the one that I started. Uh, due, to the, due to a lot of people's putting their shoulder to it. The issue is the advantage of running, one of the advantages of running a film archive is that when a fancy director, great director, comes into town to show his new movie before it's in the theaters, you get to sit next to the director and kind of see it through his eyes. And I got to sit in 1974, I got to sit next to him, Michelangelo Antonioni, and watch a film that he had just finished called Passenger with Jack Nicholson and Maria Schneider. And uh, I did see it through his eyes, but I didn't understand it totally because like all of Antonioni's films, it, had, it raised a question for me. And when he got up on the stage, I raised my hand and said, I'd like to ask the first question. And he said, okay. And I said, why is it that in all your films, the women always survive and the men die? They die or they spin off into ineffectualness. And, and, he, and he's, he, he looked down at the floor and he looked kind of tortured and he said, I don't know. Well, that was 1975 and today's, now it's 2013 and I actually know the answer to that question. The women have to survive because the women have been given the responsibility for seeing that the species survives. Women and men treat resources and opportunities Money, technology, everything. They treat it differently, completely differently. I was hired uh, recently by a, um, a corporation to consult on, to understand how they could focus on helping women and make that their next big um, corporate exercise. And I, I don't think I can talk about the company, but it's a large one and very important to, to this state. And in doing the research, that they paid me to do, it was very clear that when you invested in women, when you helped women, women turned around and invested in their family and invested in their communities, invested in their schools, invested, and there was a kind of a, an enormous pay it forward, a kind of a bonus which this company had not expected. And in the, as a result of their earliest investments, which were very modest, They've reached maybe 50 million people, at least, and changed laws and does all kinds of things. Women, naturally, are more likely to spend the opportunities that they get on, um, on the, things, the things and the people around them. Men, when they have the same kind of investments, they don't, the same kind of opportunity, they tend to spend it on uh, short-lived pleasures. Wine, women, song, and fighting cocks in third world countries. Um, and this has been proven time again and again. In our family, I'm not allowed to protest in any way any donation to the uh, League of Women Voters because my, my wife says, these people cannot be fooled. So it's important that you get in and look at the opportunity that's before us now, and that's the opportunity of connectivity. And the opportunity of connectivity is much more important than is generally realized. That's why I'm taking the time to write this book. It was a man named Charles Darwin, and most of the people who run uh, the media corporations consider themselves Darwinians. They think that the, the strongest companies win, the strongest people win, the strongest executives win. 
but actually, Charles Darwin uh, doesn't didn't happen to agree with him. He wrote, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, not the most intelligent that survives. In the long history of humankind, and animal kind too, those who learned to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. And so the key to, the, to having a winning species, a winning community, a winning person, is the ability to collaborate, to reach beyond yourself, to get help. And it isn't just uh, animals and humans. It happens, it actually is a basic strategy of matter. You can do nothing. No thing can do anything by itself. Since March 3rd of 1953, connectivity has exploded in, um, in our lives. We're unaware of how it happened. It's, a, it's very complicated. It's something that came out of the atomic bomb, the, and then the H-bomb, and in trying to create and model the universe that existed inside an exploding nuclear device, they invented cyberspace. And that suddenly allowed connectivity to become, to reach critical mass. And cyber and connectivity began to grow faster than anything else. And it began to change everything in our lives. Now, I remember what it was like at age two and three uh, to have to stop work when it got dark. And we, we, we then had our meal around the kerosene lantern and listened to the portable radio if, if the batteries, if we could afford the batteries. And then to go to sleep, because we couldn't do anymore. And we couldn't reach people very fast. I don't know if you remember what it used to be like in Oregon. There used to be a team of dogs that, that flew on a Ford trimotor all over the state looking for lost people. Doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it, it, things have changed fundamentally in ways that we, that it's hard for us now to remember. But the key issue is the importance of this connectivity and how connectivity is changing. And um, I'm gonna suggest three ways in which it's changing. Uh, the first thing is that systems and networks when they are allowed, when they're not kept separate, when they're not kept in private gardens, um, are converging to become fabrics and fields of connectivity. And, and the result is that's a much more effective way of supporting all the needs, all the growing needs of our species and of the species around us. Um, the second is that there used to be three classes or degrees of connectivity. Whenever I would, would be working for an engineer, they would always call me in for what I used to call the talk. They'd sit me down and they'd explain to the young heathen, that is, I, I was not an engineer, uh, that there were three classes of connectivity, loosely connected, closely connected, and embedded. But now there is a new form class of connectivity which I call entangled in which we are all connected in so many different ways that we are all somewhat connected all the time. And there are a lot of advantages to that. You can reach people when you're in trouble. And, and it used to be that you can't. Now there was a great man, it was a, he was a, a Jesuit priest who was also a paleontologist. His name was Tehil de Chardin. He said that the greatest threat to communities was isolation because when you are isolated and you get into trouble, you have nobody to reach for, reach out to. So I wrote a little, a little um, saying and put it up on the wall and it said, um, isolation equals death, connectivity equals life. And I can't tell you how true that is and how many lives can be saved when things are connected in the right way. In fact, there's something which my friends laughingly call Renan's law, which says the more things are connected, the better things work. Not only the better things work, but the safer people are and the more successful enterprises are. Connectivity is basically the key 
to uh, just about anything we want to do. The third way connectivity is changing is that these two worlds that used to be separate, the world of atoms and the world of bits, are becoming one world. And the more that happens, um, the more our uh, abilities are enhanced, our ability to get help are enhanced, our ability to empathize are enhanced, our ability to have transparency are enhanced, and our ability to have democratized access to resources are, are enhanced. So I'm gonna just mention four areas that are important to this city and this state in this population, and business, health, education, and security. One of the things I learned very quickly when I worked for the state of Florida, for the CIO of the state of Florida, was there isn't enough money in all of God's creation to, and I say that as a Zen Buddhist, um, to uh, cover the cost of all the requirements that government is supposed to fill. It works better if we can support an infrastructure which enables collaboration. We are not gonna be able, business will not, is not gonna prosper here unless we have lots of connectivity and a lot more than we have and a lot cheaper than we have. We need abundant connectivity. Health is getting more and more expensive all the time. It isn't necessarily getting better all the time as you all know. It, it's being forced to be more complicated all the time but it, but Eventually, the only way means we have of making great health of really affordable is to uh, put a, a great deal of it online, especially in the terms of monitoring people who are in trouble, in terms of getting people who are in trouble, in terms of spotting trouble ahead of time. Education. In LA, they've made a decision to give every single student in the LA school system an iPad. They don't like what the kids are doing it. They quickly broke the security and were checking out the porn sites and listen, watching MTV just like um, they did on the farm when I was growing up, but not as quickly, of course. Um, and, the, and the last thing is security. If you, right now, if you've got a bunch of isolated systems, if you've got Comcast and Comcast does not peer to Verizon, and Verizon doesn't peer to CenturyLink, and CenturyLink refuses to cooperate with uh, AT&T, and AT&T says screw you to all the others as well. Then when things go bad, which they always go bad, and we know right now that we're overdue for a kind of a nasty earthquake, for example, those, the time to recover and the time to overcome problems is, um, the difficulties involved in overcoming diff those kind of problems and emergencies and security issues when you don't have your basic infrastructure talking and working and collaborating with each other. Bad news, bad news. In Wall Street, I used to watch on the, on the private lists of the people, professionals, complaining that the big, the big companies did not want to put fiber into Wall Street they didn't want to put it in because they had an investment in copper. Copper didn't work nearly as well as fiber. Fiber is just so much more superior and, and has tomorrow built in. And with copper, you've got a boat anchor that's going to drag you down when the water begins to rise. And that's exactly what happened. All the copper shorted out, corroded, and all went to hell. Fiber works underwater. It's just one more way in which fiber is superior. But none of the major suppliers in Portland are willing to put in fiber. And they're also not willing to peer to one another. So if there's a big problem and it goes down, they, they all are certain that they can fix it. And the result is last time you had a big, big outage that was in uh, the East Coast from, with a major telco. They didn't they couldn't route around their problem. And, and in three states, I believe, lost coverage for, for several days. And I assure you, ambulances were slower to arrive, lots of things, lots of money was lost, and lives were lost. So it's, the basic issue is this. Most of what we enjoy now is a result of something which 
uh, scientists like to call Moore's Law, which is that you can double the amount of capacity that you can get out of a technology of a, of a given size every one or two years. Nobody agrees on the amount, and it's not precise in any case. It's actually much faster than that by the time you combine the hardware, software, and storage. Storage is growing much faster than Moore's Law. Gordon Moore only meant it to be good for 10 years. Uh, and then he said, oh, the hell with it. You guys figure it out. It continues to grow. The one thing that hasn't grown is bandwidth, is the amount of capacity in the services. Think of how fast your smartphones are improving. Now compare that to the speed with which your telco suppliers are not. And the reason why is because they are making their decisions based on business, based on what will make them money. But the issues around communications are deep infrastructure issues. We are gonna, as a species, are gonna be hard pressed to survive with our present advantage over the next 100 years. Complexity is growing rapidly, and that is a natural thing in nature. Everything gets more complex as it moves along. But the only way more complex things can prosper and survive is if they can work better together. So the real question, I think, and what this tonight's meeting really about is what's important in communication, in connectivity, communications and collaboration, and what do we have to fix so that we can catch up? And that's all I have to say. Well, I think we've gotten a number of different perspectives on, on the communications and, and the future. And uh, we always like to open our kind of question session by asking our panel if they have questions for each other. So I'm going to kind of open it to the four of you to see if there's a question that you want to share with the others on the panel. I appreciate the 30%. Uh, you're, you're correct uh, on the 30%. Um, I, I would say um, a couple things. Um, what hit me, and it's really not a question, and I'm going to go two parts here, is when you talked about collaboration, we represent an insurance company, and a number of years ago, I was uh, in a health insurance committee meeting in Salem, and uh, the room was filled with children and women, and uh, all of the children had a certain diagnosis where they needed uh, a special diet and uh, for these uh, kids to grow. And I sat there, and, and part of it was uh, they wanted to make sure that was covered in the insurance policy. And it wasn't, and so there was a mandate that ultimately it would be covered and part of the premium, and, and we'd all take care of that. But I sat there, and uh, it hit me that the Internet is what got all these women together because they were able to communicate with each other. And otherwise, they would do it by phone. They had a website, and... This is a very unique disease that these kids get. And I said to myself, this is gonna change the way we do politics because people can talk together. If they have a common goal, they can get an awful lot done. Um, so that was really powerful to me in terms of that collaboration. I would say though, um, from what I understand in terms of the companies that I represent, they are making significant investments in bandwidth, and the reason they are is because others are, and because the business side is so important to them that these are companies that need significant bandwidth, uh, law firms and the like that are down downloading files. So uh, these companies, private companies, are making these investments. They have to because the market demands it. I have, a, I have a question not only for the other panelists, but also I'd like to throw it out to the audience, uh, which has to do with commercial free speech. And we'll start with an old media problem, which is the United States is the only developed country that does not forbid the advertising to children by food companies or by corporations in general, because that's protected under commercial free speech. So. If we can't control this uh, and are suffering the consequences in terms of 
child obesity and adult obesity with the old media, how do we even begin to do it with new media? I don't know how I've been trying to I've been studying time lately because I cannot you can't deal with connectivity without dealing with time. And it's my understanding that it's very hard to reverse it. <laughs> That's my understanding, too. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think it's a freight train the way people, all conferences on time are always ca called the arrow of time, but I believe it's probably an ecosystem because def space time definitely runs at different speeds in different circumstances for different people. And connectivity changes time and the perception of time quite a bit. But I think you have to embrace the opportunities and understand um, you know, they went and they, they, a group of scientists went to go see the Dalai Lama to demonstrate quantum mechanics to him. And uh, before they demonstrated it, he's quite sophisticated about things like time, the Dalai Lama is. He also, his main hobby is fixing clocks for everybody in the village there in Dharamsala. Uh, but he's very smart about uh, physics. And... Um, before uh, they did the demonstration, the person from Vienna quoted Niels Bohr, one of the pioneers of quantum physics, as saying in a, there are two kinds of truth, re regular truth and deep truth. In regular truth, what's true is true and what's false is false. But in deep truth, one thing can be true and the opposite can also be true. And uh, the Dalai Lama said, well, there's truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> but the basic thing is, I think we we have this we have this new situation or this evolving situation, and things are changing quite a bit. And the things which is changing it rapidly now, it used to be Moore's law that was changing it. Actually, now it's connectivity. Is and the, even the person who invented Moore's law, who didn't happen to be Moore, by the way, it was the guy that Moore hired to do the research, Carver Mead. Um, when I suggested to him that connectivity was uh, had gone past Moore's law as the biggest new opportunity. He said, absolutely. He said it always was, but they just didn't report all the results that I gave them. So uh, I think that you have greater com complexity in it, and we're headed for this very complicated world. And it's an opportunity, and, and it's also the opposite. But it's kind of wonderful. <laughs> Any, any other panel questions at this point? Well, we, we do have lots of uh, questions from our audience, and actually I'm going to start with Mary Beth because a lot of people are asking you different versions of the same question. And it's basically, what can we do to help ensure that everyone has access to broadband? You mentioned the 30, 30K households and, and um, their access to the Internet. and. Just following up on that, the, the other question is, you spoke about the benefits and necessity of the city having a broadband strategy, but I didn't, she's, the comment says that they didn't hear what the strategy was. And so can you elaborate on all of those? <laughs> the first, what was the first question again? Basically, on? the first one was, how can we help the, the okay. low income? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, we're going to update the data um, through the Oregon Broadband Advisory Council. We'll be doing a scientific survey probably in the first quarter of 2014. The survey statistics that I referenced tonight were done in 2009. Um, so we know that there's still a disparity and an issue. Um, I think it's really important that we continue to educate our local elected officials. Um, you know, I know the roads need fixing and the water pipe broke on Burnside. Um, there are a lot of challenges, and as Sheldon said, there are way too many needs and not nearly enough money. But I believe that the issue of connectivity has become so important that we do need to focus on it. And it does take, um, you know, we're, we're advocating from our place in the bureaucracy, but it's really important that 
the elected officials hear from organizations like the League of Women Voters that this is an issue we want you to pay attention to because it's important for Portland's future. Um, regarding the broadband strategy, uh, we have uh, many objectives. Uh, you know, foremost is to influence deployment of state-of-the-art broadband in our community. We also have platforms about equity and closing that gap, the digital divide. I guess the good news is that for the first time, broadband is a plank in the Portland plan, and we are now in the process of developing the comprehensive plan, and we have several planks in the comprehensive plan. So our strategy has been to try to at least get the institution to recognize that this is as important as water, sewer, electricity, um, whether or not the city decides to actually deploy the infrastructure, that's a separate question and that would definitely be decided by the elected officials, but we will advocate that we have the authority to do that if our local community decides it's the right thing to do. Um, the whole strategy is, uh, you can get the written version. I did bring along the executive summary, which is on the table in the back, that kind of outlines some of the planks. Um, and we also have all of the information online on our website. And I would encourage you, I just showed you one short clip from the Prezi that we prepared for city council. I would encourage you to listen to that. First of all, the Prezi is kind of the next generation PowerPoint, even though some people have told me it makes them dizzy. I'm not gonna mention any names. Um, it's really kind of a fun tool to you know, get your information across. There are, are several embedded videos, one featuring Lou Frederick. I would highly recommend that. It's probably about 15 minutes. That gives you a really good overview. And then, as I said before, it's really important that the city hears from you that this is important. Okay. And one quick question that follows on those is what happened to the company Clear, which was supposed to provide low cost internet access to residents? Well, they are still here, actually. Um, they have not done much expansion. Um, Clear was a company that was gonna provide uh, about $20 a month internet. And I still periodically run into people who if they live close enough to, you know, an attachment on a pole that Clear has uh, put up, they get great great internet for $20 a month, but it's not ubiquitous, and it's really dependent upon uh, where you live, whether you can get it. I can't get it in my neighborhood on the east side. Okay. Um, I don't know, I've got a number of different ones here. Uh, there is one here that's kind of a general one for the group. So how much money should the taxpayers invest in to improve broadband with when so much of it is used for, and they've got in quotes, entertainment? Well, if you happen to be somebody who n needs uh, monitoring of your medical circumstances in real time, um, it doesn't matter how much um, Showtime Masters of Sex you watch. Um, if when your stats, when your arrhythmia of your heart goes bad, and you, you can't get through because of there isn't enough bandwidth, um, you're up a creek. Um, people are gonna watch what they're gonna watch. The, the issue is, it's, it's almost, I hate to say this, but it's, it's pretty definitely true. It co would cost almost the same to have really abundant connectivity if you, did, if you used fiber, as it is, uh, as it is to not have it. And when I say abundant, I mean at, at, this, at the more or less gigabit level um, to be able to. And what I went through and tried to figure out uh, which places in the world had the best, best business model and the best lowest cost, it turned out that none of it mattered. 
It mattered what your intention was. It, it turned out that, there, that, that, that everybody was using a different model, and some were using public businesses, and some were using shared public-private, and so, so on and so forth. They're just, um, but if you put as a priority to have lots and lots of bandwidth that can be used in new and different ways, it turns out to be almost as, not much more expensive to provide that, and the results you get from it are far, are much more, give you much more advantage than if, than if you haven't. In Hong Kong, for example, you can get gigabit for $25 a month. If, if I may, um, so when you have uh, candidates are running for, le for the legislature, Congress, whatever, um, in a district, what you're going to do is you're going to do a poll to see uh, what the citizens are thinking about the issues that are important to them. And you're going to ask about um, what's the highest priority. And the lottery was put on the ballot by the makers of lottery equipment. They paid to get the signatures. And this was 20, 30 years ago. And the reason that the money from the lottery that the state took their share went to education, excuse me, went to the economy and jobs is because the survey noted that that's what the public wanted first. Education was second. And so they, all, they just did their research and said, this money is going to go to great projects. Over time, the AG interpreted that to allow that to go to education. So I don't want to burst your bubble here, but when you ask the question of what's the most important consideration to the public in terms of where this legislature, legislator ought to be, they won't, they're going to talk about education, they're going to talk about jobs, to a degree health care, it's not as high, transportation, education is number one, uh, infrastructure, telecommunications doesn't even show up, doesn't even show up in the survey. And most times it's not even asked because it wasn't relevant to the pollster to ask that question. Now, I think it's important, but nonetheless, that's the reality of, of what people are thinking. Now, I like what we're talking about. My companies are in the telecom business, but in terms of investments by the state of Oregon or the, the cities, people are making those investments, their tax dollars. It just doesn't show up. That's the real, real situation. I'll I would make. add to that that um, though each of those things that you talk about, there's a broadband connectivity component in each of those, health care, transportation, all of those. And with the right framing, you know, we could be moving into the future. For example, um, telecommuting. If we had this gigabit connectivity and we had high definition interact interactive video, it could almost be as though you were in the room. Not only would that save time, but it would kind of transform because maybe you wouldn't um, need all that office space if you were, you know, a medium-sized business. I think the other thing, going to your point, the question about why should we invest anything, um, let me give you a couple of examples of applications. I think we mentioned applications is where it's at. One of the projects that we funded through the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission is the Gateway Domestic Violence Clinic. What, what did we fund? Um, interactive video. So now these victims of domestic violence do not have to transport themselves down to the Multnomah County Courthouse and face the, their abuser. They can be in the protection of their community and interact with the judge over video. To me, that's a reflection of the value in our community, and that's, that's an example of how important connectivity is. And we want to thank you on behalf of the League of Women Voters for joining us, and that will wind down our televised version, and I'll turn it back over to Mary Beth. <laughs>